Every bastion of the Siegfried line today is threatened by formidable new Allied guns. Here are the first pictures of the latest British concrete buster. The Nazis have no match for this thunderous weapon. It fires a 200-pound shell and has a range of nearly 14 kilometers. This gun is described as the most damaging field piece on wheels. Another blanket of Nazi domination is being lifted, this time at Dunkirk. The Canadian Brigade Major in charge granted a 48-hour truce. He allowed 27,000 civilians to evacuate before the final onslaught. As in previous cases, the collapse of the German garrison is the next thing on the program. The civilian trek began and the people of Dunkirk got a sight of British uniforms for the first time in four years. In a sense, this humane pilgrimage is a reunion. It has been delayed for four years, but has welcomed the more for that. Nazi censorship had choked off all communication with the outside, but the people of Dunkirk did not forget their old loyalties, nor the promise of the British to come back. That promise has been fulfilled. Great Britain had learned bitter lessons from the old wreckage of defeat on Dunkirk's beaches. All she could offer four years ago was her fighting man. On him, Britain built afresh, and the Allied world built with her. Once again, these beaches will fill with holiday crowds, but they will not forget the army which came back to pick up its helmet. Brendonk is a small town in Belgium, but it was large enough for the site of a German concentration camp. The town's liberation gave the populace an opportunity for a long-delayed ceremony. Men who had suffered within these walls, but had managed to survive, paid tribute to those of their comrades who had been tortured to death. In four years, this camp had been the scene of death for 1,100 Belgian patriots. Grim execution stakes were the only markers commemorating the dead. The Nazis revived an old trick to slow the British advance through Holland. In the desperately contested Nijmegen sector, a flood of refugees had been forced onto the roads, deliberately driven into the path of advance under a threat their towns were about to be shelled. Heavy and light artillery prepared the way for the advancing armies. Soon the British were moving over the German frontier. White flags of surrender greeted the veterans from Africa who spearheaded the operation. The men of Arnhem valiantly kept the enemy occupied while other British and Canadian forces consolidated for a second thrust into the right. Here are a few of the Arnhem men who returned from their grim but heroic operation. The world will not forget those who survived, nor the many who fell. These men will have their place in the Hall of Fame of World War II. Among those who came back was General Urquhart who commanded the 1st Airborne Division. His men fought without food, without sleep, 
but without respite for the enemy. The Germans, too, will long remember the men of Arnhem. From shore to shore, the English Channel is English once again. Since D-Day, the Nazis have clung bitterly to each and every Channel port. Nazi convoys, attempting to reinforce the holdout ports of France, were struck at will by Allied air power. Nazi installations on the Dutch coast were blasted mercilessly and virtually without opposition. RAF pilots described their assignments as shooting fish in a barrel. Weight was added to the attacks when United States 8th Air Force craft went to work in the same sector. The famous old clock tower at Calais is seen across the straits. These smoking ruins are the hallmark of futile Nazi resistance. By their stand at Calais, at Brest, at Cherbourg, and all the other fallen harbor cities, the Germans had hoped to stop vital supplies for the Allied armies. That hope literally has been blasted to eternity. This remote control flamethrower was never put to use against the Canadians. The Nazis preferred to check out and finish their days of war the easy way. One of the chief targets of Allied air power has been the U-boat pens at Brest. Here is the very center of Nazi undersea power. In the German book, these fortifications were thought to be impregnable. Nazidom's greatest military engineers put their talents into the Brest installations, but they were not enough. Under this concrete lived an army of 40,000 Nazis, Marines, submarine crews, and garrison personnel. German soldiers were found wounded beneath 16 feet of concrete. A little Germany, 35,000 strong, hewed forth into captivity. These piecemeal surrenders of the German army have followed one after the other. Not one still exists capable of hampering the flow of Allied supplies. Fifteen of the monstrous submarine berths had withstood the Allied reign of bombs but the new 12,000-pound earthquake bomb of 1944 finally let the daylight in. Germany's faith in concrete has suffered its final repudiation. There was a time when these vast underground cities represented paradise for the Nazis, but that day is past. They may choose to go deeper still, but allied weapons will be found to follow them. <laughs> 